hospital, we always save something very, very special for the end of um, the R days to keep you on the edge of your seats. So we've got Philip Rosedale here. Um, you, you met him earlier when he talked on the panel. He was the um, co-founder, uh, he was the founder of Second Life, which for so many people uh, really was the sort of beginning of the exploration of what you could do in virtual worlds and, and so much, much theory as well about um, what goes on has, has come from that in various experiments over the years. But he's here today to talk about his new venture. He's co-founder of High Fidelity VR. Um, which is um, being created to explore the future of next generation shared VR. And one of the things that um, was going on at lunchtime when you were having your lunch was the preparation for um, a very ambitious demo. So um, it, it's quite magical. All good magicians need um, an assistant. So we've got his assistant here, Thais, who's going to help get that set up as well. Thank you so much. As you can see, we have a crash cart with a lot of electronics on it. Um, I always try to do the most ambitious possible demo with the hope of some failure, but potentially also some excitement. Um, it's a delight and an honor to uh, get to be here. I love Amsterdam. I haven't been here for uh, eight years. The last time I was here, Second Life, my my, my baby and my first uh, big project in, in VR was uh, uh, was kind of at its uh, at its most crazy, and I came to speak here then. And, uh, I've heard so many topics brought up uh, today that speak to the future of VR. Uh, I particularly liked uh, the, the prior uh, presentation from I think Jack there regarding uh, shopping in VR, and I think that's something that you'll hopefully see here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, not just virtual reality, but also its potential uh, uses with blockchain technology. There we go, and uh, uh, there you go. Thank you, twice. Um, so I I have been uh, working on VR since I was a kid. Uh, you know, in the in the eighties, I stood in line and uh, I, I stood in line waiting and waiting to see a twenty thousand dollar headset that was impressive, very expensive, and had you know less performance than we have in the Vive uh, and the Rift today. Uh, in college, I invented a way to make you feel like you were in a virtual world uh, with your body, and I did it because back then we didn't have HMDs. I did it by strapping you to an exoskeleton of steel that kept you from moving, but detected your attempt to move and then conveyed the motion of the, that was detected onto your avatar. Absolutely crazy. Uh, later on in uh, 1995, when the consumer internet really happened, I uh, could think of nothing other than how to use that network to connect computers together, thousands of computers, as many computers as I could get, into a space where people could uh, create things. And about eight years after that, uh, in 2003, I finally got to launch Second Life, which was the first, uh, in many ways, a big, first big adventure into virtual worlds. Uh, it was a world that we could all come together and make things in, which was very much what I wanted to see, but it was one that was accessed through the keyboard and the mouse, not through these fancy VR devices. Um, so despite the hardware and software challenges, some of which we talked about today, some of which we talked about in the panel at lunchtime, despite those challenges uh, of the first generation devices, I deeply believe that uh, VR is very much here to stay, and that we are at the brink uh, of a new age, both in computing and also the human experience, where we're able to create and go together into worlds that are limitless and are gonna make the, the, the real Earth in many ways pale by comparison. So Mark Zuckerberg recently said, this statement captured this aspiration by saying that we'll soon have a billion people in VR, and I agree with that idea, and, and, but we've got a lot of interesting work ahead of us to make that happen. And uh, part of what I want to tell you about today is how I think the blockchain uh, in particular can make it play a role in making that possible. So what would, it, what would it mean to have a billion people in VR? I mean, Mark didn't just mean that we were going to be playing video games with headsets on, right? That would miss out on the, the bigger impact and the power of VR, which is to put us all together in a shared space, to collapse distance and put us together in new places of our own design. 
These are going to be places where we learn, where we work, and we play. And being the social animals that we are and being voracious consumers of content, we're going to want these places to be big. And they may look like this. Imagine something that has the visual quality of a video game like this image, but one in which it, one which was filled with real people, and one in which all the things that you discover are the property that they've built. How would that work? How would that work? Um, and there's going to be many of these services. So we're going to want to take our uh, we're going to want to take our uh, 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 avatars and our uh, our uh, airplanes with us into those spaces. So how is that? How is that going to work? It's going to take a lot of technical challenges to solve. But kind of pulling back from the 50,000 foot view to the tactical reality of, of social VR today, let's look at a, a similar question actually, which is how do I buy some sunglasses? If I want to go to a meeting or attend a live event or visit with my friends, I might want to do it with sunglasses on my avatar. And strangely enough, as I'll explain, that has something to do with the blockchain as well. First, uh, let me talk a little bit about what happened before Bitcoin. Second Life was, was the thing that I made. Uh, and in 2003, I knew that we needed a currency because people needed to trade with each other. And the people were from all over the world and they needed to trade with each other. And so our best approach to solving this problem at Linden ended up looking in some ways like the cryptocurrencies we have today. We created a digital currency for Second Life that was freely traded against the dollar and the euro. That was perhaps the most cryptocurrency-like piece of it. Um, and what's important about it, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, as I'll come back to it, differed in its monetary policy. But what was important about it was that it was directionally interesting because it was quite successful. Uh, in about 2015, there were about $700 million US in transactions between about a million people. Uh, about a dollar to a piece, 10 or 20 transactions a second. Its GDP is uh, a very small country, but it's of an interesting size. And so it's interesting directionally to look at what we learn uh, from what happened there. So if you scale up the economic activity in Second Life and you use what we saw there as a, a way of factoring things, what does this idea of a billion people in VR really mean? Well, it means a trillion dollar virtual economy. If we can get to a billion people in VR and they're engaging in the type of activities that I think they will be and that many here have talked about, we're talking about a trillion dollar economy. We're talking about the 15th largest economy in the world. And on the server side, 50 million servers. And if the kind of economic activity, again, in Second Life is a guide, 5 billion items and 20,000 transactions a second. Could you do this? Who, who knows the image in the background? We've got to have some fans here. Does anybody remember this? Only a couple of people. This is from the Ready Player One trailer. We stopped at that in the last conversation there. So what would happen, it isn't even possible, despite our delight in dystopian fiction, is it even possible that we could get to a billion people in VR with one, country, one company providing that service for you? Well, it's unlikely. Um, the, uh, 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 the, 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 there are so many things that are problematic with that. First of all, 50 million servers. If 50 million servers get put on, online over about a five year time, which is similar, for example, to the growth of the smartphone, you know, in scale, you're talking about putting 27,000 servers online a day. Now, no company is likely to be able to provide that kind of an, a, a, a J curve a, acceleration in a new market, but the entire internet can. From 2010 to 2015, the internet itself put on about 300,000 servers a day. So that kind of growth actually is possible. It's feasible to have that much happen around VR. But if a single, but, but a single company couldn't do it, and also a single company, uh, as, as our virtual world becomes more and more realistic, storing all this information about us and our money and our friends and our families in a single central database exposes us to, to the risk of data breaches like we saw with Equifax. And if those are as centralized as that, it will be a physical risk to our lives to actually have all of this stored in one place. Um, you know, if, 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 if you imagine any sort of a network that has a single node at its center, Destruction or access to that node essentially exposes and risks everybody. And that's all explained with the blockchain. This can be done uh, differently. So going back to that idea of buying some sunglasses, what do we need? What do we need uh, at scale in an open system to solve these problems? Well, first we do need identity. VR is different because unlike the web where you're not really there, you're just browsing a site, everything with VR, everything, uh, whether it's a game or a social experience or a, a meeting, inevitably involves you as an avatar. So you need to have some concept of identity. That's got to work. Um, the other thing uh, 
is the sunglasses themselves there. So since, sun, since sunglasses are a, a, a purely digital expression, oops, I don't know what's going on there. I'm trying to find my mouse. Never mind that, never mind that frame. Oh, there we go. Um, unlike the web, uh, uh, sorry, sunglasses are a digital thing. They don't exist at all. And so they're easy to copy like music or media. Uh, and so if we need some sort of a system that provides some degree of protection, or at least some kind of an incentive for people if they sell and buy sunglasses to buy the real ones, basically, if we expect many, many millions of content creators to come and join this world. And then obviously, if I'm going to buy them, we need some sort of a currency, we need some sort of a payment system, uh, and we need one that can work inside a virtual environment, since it's going to be pretty difficult to get my wallet out when I'm wearing a head mounted display. And it also needs to be a payment system that is going to connect uh, work for people that are across the world, just like what we saw the second night. So we need these basic things. But can we be fully decentralized? So of course, given the title of the talk, you're going to jump ahead and say, it's easy, you know, forget about the tactical issues, just blockchain, use blockchain. Well, blockchains today in their most decentralized forms, today's cryptocurrencies, have some problems that make this not work for us solving this, this, this situation. Um, fully decentralized blockchains mean that everybody, potentially people in the audience here, some of you are probably running Bitcoin or Ethereum nodes, everyone is backing up all the world's data, and they have to maintain an exact copy stored, stored of, of everything at all time. And this comes at a data and a bandwidth and, and a compute cost. A single Bitcoin transaction today costs about $2.50, which is unacceptable in the virtual world where the typical transaction size, digital assets are cheaper, is only a dollar or two. We can't suspend, we can't have a $100 transaction fee. Also, Bitcoin takes 10 minutes to confirm a transaction, which is much too long to wait to receive a virtual item. Uh, if you're waiting to, to buy something and have it show up in front of you, or to get admission to a virtual amusement park ride or something like that. So we can't do that. This is actually shows you sort of what it, what it looks like uh, when, when, when you build a random network and then you want to make a transaction you end up sending all these extra messages, and that's actually what's happening inside the blockchain today. And, and you can't reduce this uh, delay time, basically. So we need to be somewhere in the middle. Designing these, it's, it's interesting, what's emerging with, uh, with uh, blockchain systems is that there's a kind of a sliding scale between uh, fully public systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum and completely centralized databases. There's a lot of interesting solutions in the middle, and that's where we're going to end up. Uh, so our proposed solution, and one that we're actually working on at High Fidelity, uh, is to build a blockchain, to create a new blockchain for, uh, uh, yeah, for use in the virtual world, which is based on a different technique called federated consensus, which I'll explain. This blockchain can store identity information, it can store currency itself, and it can also store information about digital assets, their registration and ownership. Um, this is something that build the way we're doing it, and we're hoping to, hoping to host others in doing it, builds on our open source VR servers that we've already created. Um, and the way, uh, where the public blockchains that we've already built uh, allow this unlimited number of people to become miners, uh, what I mean by federated consensus is a type of blockchain in which you create a smaller number of still sort of mutually distrusting individuals or organizations who run uh, a smaller number of what are called block signing nodes. And I think it, I, I mean, I actually, I saw a show of hands earlier. I'm gonna assume some degree of blockchain expertise or interest here as a starting point. So the members of this network can add new members as demand grows, but they can keep the network size small enough so that you guarantee very, very high performance, one of the things I touched on. Transaction fees are only needed uh, to prevent spam and, and certain types of attacks. And so you can have the transaction fees for these blockchain transactions be very low. Um, so the way this looks compared to that last diagram is that you have a ring of these consensus operators and transactions can then be sent from anyone who connects to any one of the big nodes all the way around the ring very quickly. So this is a different kind of blockchain. There's a different problem, which I touched on earlier, the second line, which is monetary policy. The problem with using existing cryptocurrencies for money in virtual worlds, or for that matter, any kind of transaction, is that right now they're rapidly and unpredictably going up in value. Technically, that's what we refer to as deflation. And that's exactly what you don't want in a day-to-day -day operating currency. Because there's a limited number of Bitcoins in circulation, and awareness of cryptocurrencies right now is going up, 
their price is also going up. So these scarce cryptocurrencies are more like a commodity, they're more like gold than they are actually a money. And what we need to actually uh, build a virtual world is a money. Another way of looking at this, which is kind of cool, I've been trying to find ways to explain this, so let me test this out on you, is imagine a virtual economy starting on the left there in which there are only two people and one Bitcoin. And every day they use the Bitcoin to pay each other for goods and services. So maybe one of them sells bananas and the other one gives out cheap legal advice or something. And they swap that Bitcoin back and forth as they exchange those two items. Now imagine that in the next day, out of interest, a couple more people show up that want to use Bitcoin. The problem here is that if you only have one Bitcoin, you have to split it in half so that each one of them can have a half a Bitcoin to trade their stuff back and forth. But if you think about what I just said, that doubles the imputed value of the Bitcoin because the transactions that they were making were the same as the first people. And so as the network of people using the system grows, the expense of the currency goes up and up and up. The monetary policy we want for a virtual world is different, and it's actually the same thing as in Second Life. What you want is something, and this is possible with an algorithm, that actually expands the amount of money that's in the system at a rate proportional to its increase in use. You can, you, you can potentially build an electronic currency which still sort of mirrors the, the uh, monetary policy of something more like the real world. And this is part of what we're doing with this system, increasing the money supply as the value goes up. And this worked for Second Life. Actually, remarkably, those many billion, somewhere between five and 10 billion dollars in transactions now over the last decade, while those transactions happened and while enormous growth occurred in Second Life, the price actually stayed stable to about 5% over that period. Many large periods of time, the Linden dollar was more stable against the dollar uh, than the dollar was stable against the yen. So this is doable. So now let me go into some of what we're actually doing, and, and with a little luck from the demo gods, I'll show you some of it. We're going to build a, a wallet into high fidelity that gives you access to this cryptocurrency. Uh, but the wallet basically is going to be something that actually works in VR. It's going to be very uh, easy to easy to use and easy easy to touch. Uh, you know, unlike the sort of complexity of some of the cryptocurrency stuff today. Uh, we're also going to give away initial grants of money for people that prove their identity. I'll touch on that later. And, and this cryptocurrency, like other ones, is going to trade on multiple exchanges. One of the beautiful blessings of cryptocurrencies is that you just kind of get that for free. The second thing is that, as I mentioned, digital assets that are sold in the virtual world are going to come with these electronic certificates, which are themselves going to live on the blockchain, but again are going to be visible in a fun, easy way in the virtual world, so that you can tell that something is genuine. Um, and when you buy something, you'll receive a certificate showing that you bought it, and anybody else that walks up to you and sees that item on you or with you will be able to immediately see that certificate, but the certificate itself will be stored on the blockchain, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, again, the way that works in the world is that anybody can inspect the things that they discover around them in the virtual world. A very cool property of the virtual world, the ability to sort of put information like that on the atoms, if you will, uh, that the real world doesn't have. And part of the, the exciting thing about that is that uh, many people will want to be conspicuous consumers. Those, those certificates will list you know, the price they paid or the name of the owner or whatever in the same way that we want to drive around Ferraris today. And that kind of uh, uh, conspicuous <laughs> desire to show off what you own will actually drive people to click on this button and go get something for themselves. And so this idea of using the blockchain to record information about what people own um, is, I think, a very interesting and compelling one. Now let's talk for a second about identity. Identity in VR is not at all the same thing as it is on the web, uh, or Facebook, for that matter. On the web, there's nobody else there with you. You're, you are your credit card number. There's, there's no concept of you that you're sharing with anyone else. On a social network, on a social network, there aren't public gathering places. There's just your first order of friends with whom you're generally sort of sharing everything or nothing. But in VR, you'll want to be, often you'll want to be pretty much anonymous. If you're walking around on the street, amidst other people that you've never met in VR, just like in the real world, you'll want to offer your name as a some kind of greeting. You won't want to have your name floating over your head all the time like I'm suggesting here. Also, if you go into a meeting, on the other hand, you'll want to have a very secure way of proving who you are. And the other thing that's neat is that, or important, just like in the real world, you're going to want to control disclosure of pieces of information selectively. So again, what we think can be done in this case, these pieces of information can be stored directly on the blockchain. So for example, 
I can prove to what we call a notary agent, but fancy words, but I can, I can prove to an individual or a company one time that I own the email address Philip, maybe by clicking on a link like you normally do. But once I do that, that agent will write into this public blockchain that, that the person who owns the key at this magic point on the blockchain owns that email address. I can do the same thing with my phone number. I can do that with things like passport photos. So this blockchain that we're building will allow people who want to get access to this enormous virtual world to use it to store this identity information. And once, once you do it that way, no one controls the data but you because there's no database to breach. The only information, which is at different points on that blockchain, are these little pieces of information about you that have been proven. This is a very important uh, capability and implication of the blockchain that people aren't understanding, and I'm trying to hopefully trying to explain it. You know, you guys are the first people who have seen any of this discussion, so this is a capability and a demonstration that we've, we've uh, uh, not shown before. So in summary, uh, before I show you this, the, uh, the, the, the blockchain brings together, uh, or we believe that we can build uh, a public blockchain that brings currency assets and identity all into one place. We think that unlike Bitcoin or Ethereum, we can actually build a stable monetary policy so you got something that looks more like, more like a real world currency for trade. We can build a public registry for protecting IP. Uh, we can allow identity to be verified. And uh, maybe most importantly, relative to that first sort of you know, Facebook centralized image, you as the operator in these worlds will control all those keys, so you're the only one that can use them. So I'm 